tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We were booked every day and now every single party is cancelled. Too little, too late. Why business owners say lost revenue from COVID restrictions can't be made up. Also. I was surprised at how, how low you kind of feel. Vaccinated or not, your chances of getting COVID have increased. We look at how to cope and. 50 years of my life, four generations of stuff, everything's gone. Weeks later, another blow. Not much left at a flood damaged storage facility in Abbotsford. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with criticism from local businesses shut down because of COVID restrictions. They say new relief from the B.C. government is too little, too late. As provincial affairs reporter Mira Baines tells us, they feel the $10,000 grant won't make up for the revenue they're about to lose. An empty banquet hall is not what owner Jim Calsey expected during the holidays. Weddings and Christmas parties are cancelled, but also traditional lordy parties in January in the South Asian community to celebrate the birth of a baby. We were booked every day and now every single party is cancelled. The closures of event venues, clubs, bars and gyms is set to last until at least January 18th, leaving many businesses wondering how they'll get through the next few weeks. The province will begin accepting applications for the COVID-19 closure relief grant in January. Relief grants will be between $1,000 and $10,000 in one-time funding that will be provided to eligible businesses based on their number of employees, following the similar formula that we used for the previous circuit breaker relief grant program. The one-time funding grant is meant to help businesses order to shut down this week, in addition to support from the federal government. Under the federal program, workers can get $300 per week. Employers who are subject to capacity restrictions can apply for wage subsidies under a local lockdown program. But Calsey says that's not enough. Well, it's not even close, you know, that it's also based on number of employees, so smaller venues have less employees, so they get less money, you know, to even cover our rents, our mortgages, to cover payroll, cost of food. Some businesses are questioning why restaurants can stay open with tables limited to six people, yet other industries are forced to shut down. We had to close down three times so far. And every time comes with its own drama and challenges. The owner of this personal training gym says what the BC government is offering isn't enough to help her deal with lost revenue and keep up with paying staff. A lot of our businesses in the fitness industry, they really do rely on the January for their survival. She says for her clients, their fitness routine has helped with their mental health through the pandemic. Still, with the Omicron variant pushing COVID cases higher, it's unclear whether the restrictions could be extended. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. For the third consecutive day, BC has once again smashed the record for new daily cases. And for the first time ever, we've gone over 2,000. That's a figure that nearly triples infection rates from just last week. Now, if we break down the rolling average per region, you can see Vancouver Coastal Health is showing the steepest climb. That health region tells us one out of every 10 people getting screened are testing positive for the virus. The province has so far identified 975 cases of the Omicron variant, just about quadrupling from last week. And this is already putting a lot of strain on our health care system. Now officials predict 3,000 surgeries will be postponed each week in order to manage hospital capacity. This North Vancouver man due to undergo nose surgery next month, but with skyrocketing COVID-19 cases, he's telling CBC he is expecting the procedure to be, which was scheduled for January 12th, to be postponed for a third time. Health Minister Adrian Dix says surgery reschedulings would start January 4th. This will allow staff to be redeployed elsewhere, including vaccination clinics. And as the province tries to free up capacity, experts warn hospitalizations driven by Omicron could overwhelm our health care system by mid-January. The BC COVID-19 modeling group says once testing in hospitals reach capacity, it will be challenging to track the growth in infection rates. As you can see from the long lines outside a testing site near Queen Elizabeth Park today, many people are looking to get tested before Christmas, 
This has prompted BC's seniors advocate to appeal to health officials to make rapid testing available to the public in order to protect vulnerable people. Well, I am hopeful that uh, we can find a way using pharmacies to, to dispense uh, rapid testing kits to uh, families who have frail elderly people they need to visit. We can match people's uh, PHN to make sure that um, they fit the criteria for a deployment of these rapid tests. Isabel McKenzie says while it's laudable the province has made rapid testing available to long-term care homes, there are many vulnerable seniors living at home who are unable to access rapid tests. She's urging those who have secured the tests privately to use them sparingly, and if they can, try to prioritize those who are frail and vulnerable. And as you heard from the seniors advocate, some people are already using rapid tests. Now, if those results show you're positive for COVID, doctors say it's important to let your health authority know. For people living in Vancouver Coastal Health, this is the website on your screen right now, beginning vch.ca. Fraser Health residents can visit this website at fraserhealth.ca and follow instructions to report your positive COVID test. Now, the province is now requiring proof of vaccination to use swimming pools and aquatic centers. While some municipalities already had this rule in place, it's now the mandate province-wide. The city of Vancouver says its pools remain open, but saunas and steam rooms will be closed. The province says the requirement is in place until January 31st and could be extended. Now, as Omicron spreads, many experts say vaccinated or not, chances you or someone you know will be infected are high. And receiving a positive diagnosis can be scary, but as Janella Hamilton explains, there are some ways to ease the worry and help you cope. Runny nose and then just really congested and then it moved down to my chest. Being double vaccinated, Robbie Davey didn't think her cold-like symptoms could be COVID until her son started experiencing the same. The day he had a fever, I booked a test. And we got in pretty quickly and found out he was positive. Positive, a word that brings with it many feelings for Davy and thousands of people in BC. Davy says at first she wasn't ashamed she had the virus, but was surprised by the reaction of others around her. And I finally let a friend know. I, I told her and she said, oh, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> so obviously it's still circulating that people are wanting to be super secret about it. Davy said she turned to vitamin C, ginger and Sudafed to provide some relief. A good start if your symptoms are mild. The most important thing is to drink lots and lots of fluids and stay hydrated and rest. And, and if you have any sort of pains and aches or fever, uh, you can take Advil or uh, Tylenol. For some, the emotional impact can be harder to handle. I was surprised at how how low you kind of feel just at home without any connection with people. First things first, exercise always helps. But you could also try and learn something about language or culture. Davy says she chose to bury her nose in new books to get her through isolation and reduce pandemic-related stress. Unfortunately, through the pandemic, we've seen much evidence that people are turning at least to alcohol more than they have in the past. Greatser says the pandemic has also sparked a rise in stigma and prejudice against people who have the virus but talking with others can help. Reminding people that even when we do everything right, the virus spreads, but also reminding them that uh, even if mistakes have been made, uh, it doesn't change the fact that there you know, is a family or uh, a friendship connection that has spanned for time and uh, a mistake or bad luck shouldn't really color that. He says the pandemic has many unknowns and as cases continue to rise, he reminds people they are not alone. Janella Hamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. A month after catastrophic flooding in Abbotsford, customers of a storage lot that went underwater are just beginning to see how badly their belongings are damaged. Dozens of containers filled with personal possessions submerged. As John Hernandez reports, now people say they're also being hung out to dry by the storage company. The floods might have subsided, but water is still pouring out of these storage containers in Abbotsford. This whole thing is bad. Um, 
Everything you touch has got a brown slime on it. Mark and Kelly Therian had been planning to move to the Fraser Valley from Nanaimo for months, so they had their belongings taken to this storage lot, Big Steel Box. When Sumas Prairie flooded last month, the site went underwater. I guess at first I was hopeful that we were one of the top bins because they didn't tell us till um, a couple weeks later that we weren't. Now they're finding out they've lost everything from furniture to priceless family heirlooms. 50 years of my life, four generations of stuff, everything's gone, everything. More than 100 containers soaked with water. Dozens of customers are trying to sift through the wreckage. We got in to see it and it's devastating. It's just beyond the mold. Some here say they have upwards of $100,000 in damages, but Big Steel Box isn't offering compensation. Instead, it's telling customers to take it up with their insurers. Those who have are finding out there won't be any relief and feel misled. We were never told that their business was on a floodplain which meant it didn't matter whether we had insurance or not, it wasn't going to cover it. it there was just no, nothing. That a company can advertise secure, safe storage and put it on a floodplain. I, I don't know how they can get away with that. Since many who use this service don't live in the area, they also won't qualify for government supports either. The company says it's helping people dispose of destroyed items but won't offer compensation, while customers try to clean and salvage what they can day after day. I don't sleep. I, I get here as soon as I can to deal with my crap and clean it. I got nowhere to go. I got to clean it here. Cleaning, he says, only gets harder as temperatures drop. John Hernandez, CBC News, Abbotsford. Tonight, a heroic story. When the flooding first started in Abbotsford, water, of course, seeped in everywhere and left so much damage. And when water reached the Barrowtown pump station in Abbotsford, there was no time to wait for help. Long before volunteers from elsewhere arrived to lend a hand, it was up to residents to act and act fast. As Bell Peary reports, the decisive middle-of-the-night actions of a group of neighbours was the final defence against certain disaster. What's left are remnants of a rescue. We're kind of, you know, on cleanup duty, you know, picking through the, the rubble and, and just trying to get things back to back to normal. Barrowtown is rural and small, but the threat of catastrophe was huge. When November's torrential rain hit, it was up to residents to keep it at bay. Grab the strength you have and deal with it. Um, it's not a matter of standing back and watching others do it. You just all play part. It's you throw your eagles in the drawer. We're on the dike. And I can see through the trees the highway, so the homes are where? So just out in behind uh, is where our actual homes are. And what was happening is the uh, increased rainfall was running off of this rock quarry and created uh, heavy flows down in the valley here, which started these rock slides that came down. The Sumas River breached its banks. Chunks of North Parallel Road were gone. And then all of a sudden, our road, uh, our only exit out of here was under three to four feet of water. The only option was to find a new way out. It was four in the morning. And he'd actually climbed his machine up to the dike to the freeway and started pulling out all the concrete bulwarks and then just made a bit of a base road out of it and pulled some material that he could to, to build a roadway to drive on. The men work in construction. Luckily, they had heavy equipment at home. In darkness, they built an access to Highway 1. At most, 20 people live in Barrow Town. Young families were moved out first. And that's when we planned for the four or five of us to stick around and start to battle what was to come. The Barrowtown pump station was in danger. Normally, the plant moves Sumas water out to the Fraser River, but the flood was at its door. Staff were struggling to keep the facility working. Within hours, dozens of volunteers came from neighboring communities to help stack sandbags. It was an all-night effort to build a new temporary dike, an effort to save the pump station. Had that pump station swamped, uh, today we would be talking about 10 feet of water over the highway and it would be there for a year. 
They are real heroes. Everyone is grateful, even the Prime Minister. We got a, a handshake from Trudeau and a thank you for... Chicken wing. For what we did, or an, <laughs> an elbow bump or whatever <laughs> we're doing these days. Barrow Town Homes were never at risk. Keeping the pump station safe was all about the Sumas Flats, the farmers and families who lived there. It was a fight for their land. But we were just a group of guys with the right equipment at the right time doing what we thought was best. That's just how it is, they say, in a small community with a big heart. Bell Peary, CBC News, Barrowtown. Truly admirable and amazing. And, you know, since the floods, many people are also trying to find ways to make a difference, particularly given the time of year. Vancouver Chinese Benevolent Association has raised $400,000 to help people who need it. That they demonstrate that the Chinese Canadian immigrant community is a part of the larger community, that they would like to help. He presented the Canadian Red Cross with a number of those giant checks. The donation came from several organizations around the province. With matching pledges from the provincial and federal governments, these donations will add up to $1.2 million. And the B.C. Federation of Labour is making a contribution. Volunteers have been busy preparing hundreds of holiday hampers Stuff with toys, food, and gift cards. These will be handed out at the Federation's annual Christmas dinner tonight. In Japan, McDonald's stores are pausing orders on medium and large fries because of the recent flooding here in B.C., adding to their potato supply chain disruption. The Port of Vancouver says it is still working its way through a backlog of built-up cargo. McDonald's Japan says it will resume sales of larger size fries in the new year. Well, cold, wet winter weather is set to blast across much of B.C. in the coming days. It's a big worry for people living on our streets and those trying to get around. Dan Burt joins us live with more on how you're being asked to help yourself and those around you. So, Dan, what's the advice? We've heard it before, Anita, but it bears repeating. If snow and ice fall, you need to shovel and salt the sidewalk around your home so others can get by safely, especially seniors. Also, check in on elderly and vulnerable neighbours and loved ones. Make sure they're doing OK. And the public safety minister says you need to check the weather. Make sure that you put together an emergency kit in case of power outages. Follow directions of your local government to find the nearest emergency warming shelter. Bring food, water and warm clothes or blankets when travelling by car. And above all else, be safe. Now, the government says it's offering more than 1,900 temporary shelter spaces and almost 360 extreme weather shelter spaces. Here's a look at shelters open across the province from B.C. Housing. This includes year-round ones, extreme weather and temporary sites, as well as drop-ins. They range from Fort Nelson in the north all the way down to Vancouver Island and the Okanagan. Here's a closer look at the lower mainland. They're concentrated in Abbotsford, Surrey, New Westminster, and in Vancouver with a few here and there. Now, some offer dozens of spaces Others, four beds. Space can be limited because of COVID rules. Two new shelters have opened in Delta and Port Moody, run by a support agency, Phoenix. For a more comprehensive list of the shelters and what various cities are doing, we'll have a story on our website, cbc.ca slash bc, where you can find more information. Again, be prepared for that cold, snow, freezing rain, and check on those who may need help. And cities like Vancouver are prepping their salt piles and preparing to brine major roads, bus, and bike routes. Anita. Yeah, things are going to get really messy. Good advice, Dan. Thank you. And Johanna is off this week, so we welcome Nick Cernkovich. And Nick, I know other pro parts of the province get these freezing temperatures. Those are mm. expected. But in the lower mainland, this seems pretty abnormal. Yeah, I mean, this is... Um it's not unheard of, but definitely it's kind of unusual because we're looking at a mix of sort of the rain, the freezing rain potentially here, and then uh, some significant amounts of snowfall are possible. And it, it's really all thanks to this uh, cold Arctic air that's pushing down from the north. Now we're going to see a transition as we head through the next 24 hours, and then we're diving into the deep 
cold weather uh, as we head into mid next week. So this is a look at the temperature forecast. So you notice tomorrow more or less stays the same. We sit just above the zero mark, but as we head through tomorrow evening, the temperatures start to drop down below the zero mark. And that's where we get some of this freezing happening. We've also got snowfall that's going to move into the region and this cold Arctic air continues to drive down uh, through Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and even into next Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Uh, there are special weather statements in effect here for the cold Cold weather, and that includes Metro Vancouver, but also this mixed precipitation and the incoming snow. And we've got some lingering warnings as well from the system that's just pushed out. Tonight, you can expect to see sort of a rain snow mix as we move through the next few hours across the region. But what's happening here is we're sitting right on that zero mark. So some areas are going to see rain, others are going to see snow. And even down in the lower mainland, it's going to be sort of transitioning back and forth between the two until finally, as we head into sort of Friday afternoon, evening, the temperatures start to come down and it becomes just a snowfall event. So for now, here's a look at the next 24 hours with mixed precipitation, bit of rain showers tomorrow, and then the snowfall. I'll tell you how much coming up in just a bit. Okay, we'll talk to you soon, Nick. Thanks. Goodbye. And NHL games may be shut down this holiday season, but a lot of Canucks fans have reason to celebrate as the team rides a six-game winning streak. One super fan is thanking new coach Bruce Boudreau with this Christmas-themed song. Would you tell me if this is for real? This team has won its last six games. They're giving me all the free. A snippet there of Boudreaux Tell Me, a parody of Ariana Grande's Santa Tell Me. That's Clay Emu on the piano and Marie Hue serenading the new coach. Uh, the tribute has 2,000 views on YouTube and more than 20,000 on Twitter. Boudreaux Tell Me, this isn't a dream. Cause I can go through more losing one to cheer for a good team. Okay, it's the variant we can't stop worrying about, Omicron. So what are experts saying about the latest data and why are there reasons for a little bit of optimism? More on that coming up. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. One PEI woman has yet to meet a nut that she can't crack. Now for the past four decades, Daphne Campbell has been collecting nutcrackers. She's got more than a hundred in her collection. I love Christmas. Uh, you know, I grew up in the country in a family and, and uh, you know, it was church and community and family were the main things that were important and I think they still are today. So I love celebrating Christmas and decorating and sharing it with my family and close friends. Uh, well, I've been collecting nutcrackers for over 40 years and from going from one or two, it came to about 175. And if you had told me that 40 years ago, I, I would think you were nuts. But yeah, it's a, it's a big, big lot of, of uh, nutcrackers, yeah. <laughs> this is the first one that I got. It wasn't a very expensive one, but I wanted a little wooden toy because our children were very small at the time and something that was indestructible. So, so this is him. Oh my, <laughs> I have many favorites, I guess is the best way to answer that, but no, not really one favorite. They all have a story to tell, and, uh, whether it's a place I visited or they remind me of somebody or I have two the same and they remind me of my 12 year old uh, twin grandsons now. I have the little girl that's from the Nutcracker. Uh, it reminds me of my granddaughter that's five. And we have this one, which is very special. This is my red hat lady because my mother belonged to the Red Hat Society. So when I look at it, I'm, I think of my mother, uh, which I often do anyway, but it's just a constant reminder of, of the things that she liked and, and the fun she had. So good memory. Yeah.
the latest COVID case counts are breaking records. We've seen the highest numbers ever here in B.C. and in Quebec, almost 9,400 cases today. As Lindsay Duncombe reports, the numbers have triggered another round of restrictions, thrown holiday plans out the window and triggered renewed concerns about the health care system. There is a Christmassy COVID-y quiet in Quebec. Celebrations changing. Worry getting worse. A lot of anxiety, a, a lot of, you know, where, what, what is really going to happen? Where are we going to eat? Where, who's going to be eating with who? As people line up for tests, the reality is those staggering case numbers are only part of the picture. It's not just Quebec. Across the country, testing can't keep up with infections. Our testing capacity is near its maximum. Clearly, as the number of cases are going up, people are either going to be waiting longer and longer to get tested. They're going to look at these huge lineups and say, I'm not going to get tested. The thing that seems to make a real difference in the fight against Omicron is that third vaccine dose. In Toronto, clinics will keep boosting Christmas or not. More than 45,000 doses were delivered yesterday alone. COVID-19 uh, won't take the holidays off, doesn't take the holidays off, doesn't even know it's a holiday, and so we're not taking the holiday off either. And in BC, some not yet eligible crossed into the U.S. for a booster. We went in there and uh, uh, they filled out the forms and so forth, got, got my shot, and, uh, and then popped back over the border, and it was free. People getting sick is one thing, ending up in the hospital is another. So the hope is, is that all these measures are going to be able to curtail the spread of the virus and that we won't see, you know, a, a rapid rise in hospitalizations that we might be able to adapt. So the message for now is keep those streets quiet and those celebrations small. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. And as case counts shatter records here and across the country, Canada's hospitals are undergoing growing strain. It's meant many health care workers are being swept out by isolation protocols. As Chris O'Neill Yates reports, it's led some provinces to consider new protocols to keep them on the job. To get ahead of sick calls and the potential for a staffing crunch, new rules in Ontario. Healthcare workers who've been exposed to COVID will no longer have to stay off work as long as they follow a strict testing regimen. At some hospitals, it comes as welcome news as already burned out staff face more shortages. And if there's more absenteeism, you know, they're going to be asked to work more shifts, longer hours, uh, looking after more patients, which is, is also a safety concern for both patients and our healthcare workers. We have, you know, frontline uh, uh, healthcare workers that are double vaccinated and triple vaccinated. So um, I, I think that that's reassuring. But not everyone agrees now is the time for such measures. I would have said, wait with this strategy, with the strategy of, of, of working quarantine, right? Wait until things become even more serious. Because if not, all you're doing is just adding to it. Working beside people who uh, could possibly have COVID um, and that that's being done knowingly, what that does to their morale is it reinforces the notion that they already have, that they're not valued. In Alberta tonight, as the cases start to take off. As Omicron is spreading farther and faster than anything we've ever seen before. A new approach to lure back as many as 1,400 healthcare workers who are currently on unpaid leave because they're not vaccinated. Tonight, the government says they can come back if they agree to a frequent rapid testing routine. In a statement, the health minister says they're still putting patients first, writing, we need to adjust the policy to maximize capacity and avoid losing any staff if we can while still keeping patients safe. It's a balance that officials are weighing across the country right now as the Omicron surge continues to set record case numbers in most provinces. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Vancouver. The Canadian economy grew for the fifth consecutive month in October, according to Stats Canada. Gains for the month were seen across most sectors, including manufacturing, particularly in the auto sector, despite ongoing supply chain disruptions. Gains were also seen in retail, construction and home resales. Overall economic activity in October was 0.4 percent below pre-pandemic levels in February of 2020, but that gap is narrowing. 
And some new data from the UK tonight suggests Omicron may be less severe than the Delta strain. Britain's public health agency cautions that those results are preliminary. And while experts see it all as encouraging, Laura Mack and Isherwood tells us we're not in the clear yet. Well, this latest data from the UK Health and Security Agency appears to show that if you are infected with the Omicron variant of COVID-19, you are 50 to 70 percent less likely to need care in hospital if you become infected with it. Now, that, of course, will be welcome news to many, particularly considering the high uh, infection rates in the United Kingdom at the moment. We experienced a record daily number of infection rates here uh, in the last 24 hours, just under 120,000 new cases reported. But scientists are urging caution uh, moving forward across the Christmas period because they say with that sheer volume of cases, actually hospitals could still become overwhelmed because of that sheer number. They are also saying that the vaccines actually appear to become less uh, useful after about 10 weeks. The effects of those seem to wane after 10 weeks after your most recent jab and that of course means that people do need to continue to follow those usual protocols uh, washing hands and wearing masks in enclosed spaces now the uk prime minister boris johnson has not uh, instructed any further restrictions in England, at least, or the rest of the United Kingdom ahead of Christmas Day. Instead, he's saying he wants people to be careful to take lateral flow tests themselves before they meet family and friends to try to prevent that spread. He's not ruled out imposing any further restrictions, though, after Christmas Day. And we've already heard from the Welsh and Scottish governments that they're about to impose uh, restrictions on numbers of people meeting for indoor events and outdoor events. Some of those will come into force from Boxing Day, but we're still waiting to hear if there's anything else being brought forward for England. Laura Macon Isherwood for CBC News, London. These were events uh, that we have never seen before uh, in this province uh, at the, at the, in the way that they happened and in, and in, and in their impact. Deadly heat waves, wildfires, extreme flooding and landslides, not to mention the pandemic and a toxic drug supply. It's been a year. BC's Deputy Premier Mike Farnworth looks back at it next. Here in Canada, a strange kidnapping story with a happy ending. It involved the daughter of B.C. millionaire Jim Pattison, the man who headed Vancouver's Expo 86. Kidnappers held Cynthia Kilburn for 14 hours. But tonight she's free and police are holding the people they believe were behind the whole thing. Ian Hanamansing has that story. This quiet neighborhood is where it all started at 9 o'clock Friday morning. Cynthia Kilburn was taken from her home, her four-year-old twins tied up and left behind. The neighbors we talked to didn't hear a thing, and they're still shocked at what happened. I mean, it's the sort of thing you just don't believe is going to happen. Not, not my neighborhood. <laughs> the kidnappers called Kilburn's father, millionaire Jimmy Patterson. Friday afternoon, the kidnappers got an undisclosed amount of ransom money. That night, Patterson's daughter was released. Well, we're uh, very grateful to the Lord that things turned out at, uh, in our family uh, okay. On Saturday, it appears the alleged kidnappers may have gone on a wild spending spree. A limousine chauffeur says he drove around six people who seemed to have an endless supply of cash. They were very well-mannered, uh, well-dressed, uh, very polite, polite at all times. Uh, uh, I was, I was, it was a pleasure for a limousine driver to, to drive people around like that. Falcone says he took his passengers on a whirlwind tour of some of Vancouver's most expensive stores. Um, the truck was just loaded with clothes and, uh, and two guitars and an amplifier and uh, suits upon suits upon suits. But police say a security guard at the department store where the ransom money was picked up recognized the alleged kidnappers when they returned and arrests quickly followed. We presently have three adult males, three juvenile males, and one juvenile female in custody. Patterson says his daughter and her family are fine, all things considered, 
The police say with seven people in custody, the family is in no further danger. Ian Hanamansing, CBC News, Vancouver. He's the province's deputy premier. Days after stepping into that role, Mike Farnworth, who's also the Minister for Public Safety, was swept up in tackling some of the most severe natural disasters to hit B.C. in decades. And that was far from the only challenge he and the NDP government have been faced with this year. He spoke with our legislative reporter Mira Baines to look back on the past 12 months. Farnworth took over from Premier John Horgan on November 4th when Horgan stepped aside to battle throat cancer. Just over a week later, the Fraser Valley and Interior were hit with unprecedented flooding. Farnworth says 2021 has caused the government to take another look at what needs to be done in the face of climate events and the funding needed to be better prepared. We currently are working on a uh, diking and flood strategy. Uh, that work has been underway, uh, but both the Premier uh, and myself have said publicly that uh, we need to rethink uh, that decision back in 2003, which had taken place, which, which in essence downloaded responsibility for diking to local government. Uh, I think we need to recognize that the dike situation is it cannot be a patchwork, that there needs to be greater provincial oversight. Uh, and so absolutely you are going to see, uh, I think, some, uh, some important changes uh, in, in, in regards to, uh, to dikes. Uh, and how they're overseen and uh, in terms of the repair and the maintenance uh, of, the, of the diking system uh, in, in, in the province. Farnworth also faced criticism this year about a lack of communication by the government warning people of the dangers of the heat dome or atmospheric rivers. More than 500 people were killed in the heat dome and four people have been confirmed dead in the landslide on Highway 99. One person is still missing. Both of these were events uh, that we have never seen before uh, in this province uh, at that, at, in the way that they happened and in, and, in, and in their impact. I mean, the experts on the, uh, the, the, the atmospheric river, which is a new, I think is one of the sort of the new terms uh, coming out of 2021, the scope of it uh, was more than they expected. To me, one of the important things is, is that, uh, you know, Communities did respond. The province did respond. Uh, will there be lessons to be learned from this? Absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a review underway on the heat dome, for example, uh, being done by the coroner. Uh, and we want to make sure that we learn the lessons uh, from, that, uh, from that tragedy uh, so that we are better prepared in the future. He says an alert ready system will be in place in 2022 for the next summer. We have all the other uh, ways of notifying people about a, either an evacuation alert or an evacuation order that are done at that local level basis. Um, but that being said, we are going to be looking, we are working to make sure that we've got the alert ready system in place for the, uh, the next fire season uh, by starting it out in the, uh, in the central interior. Farnworth says recovery efforts are underway to help rebuild Linton, which was destroyed by fire, and the destruction of Highway 8, which has isolated First Nations communities. So far, the federal government has allocated $5 billion. He says assessments are still underway to determine how much it will cost to build back infrastructure to withstand climate change events. As public safety minister, he's also dealing with the transition of Surrey RCMP to Surrey Police and green-lighted the process. He says the switchover is moving along quickly. Uh, significant work is underway. So obviously you pay, would pay close attention to what happens uh, at a municipal election. Uh, but the reality is, is that transition is, 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 is well underway. Uh, the council voted unanimously to terminate the contract. And so, uh, you know, 
uh, events are going to continue unfold in terms of the election, but that transition is well underway. As for the Premier, Farnworth says his health is improving. I, I talk with the Premier every day and I can tell you that he's very upbeat. Uh, he's feeling very good uh, about uh, the prognosis. The doctors tell him the prognosis is really good. Uh, and uh, as he joked with me, uh, yes, the radiation, you know, it, it, it makes you feel tired and, 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 and it's not the most fun thing to go with. But he said, uh, as, uh, Ellie says, uh, his wife, uh, she kind of appreciates the quiet a little bit sometimes. Uh, but he's doing really well. Farnworth is also upbeat. He says the recent disasters have shown that people in B.C. are resilient and can get through some of the most difficult times the province has faced. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. It's Christmas Eve Eve, and we have an update from the North Pole to share with our younger viewers what we can tell you about Santa's whereabouts. And at 6.40, you're looking at a live look up at Grouse Mountain there behind the Harbour Centre, downtown Vancouver. Coming up, Nick Sternkovich is here with a full weather forecast. Okay, we've been promised a white Christmas. Will it happen? Stay with us.
We all know Santa delivers presents to millions of children in one night, but there is a pre-flight checklist to go through before he can get to that Christmas wish list. So here's a video from Transport Minister Omar Alagbra's office. Control room, standby procedure. Control room here, standing by. Let's get started. Weather? Clear. Flight plan? Flight plan ready. Communications? Ready. GPS? GPS linked. Guidance? Guidance check. Radar? Radar check. Airspace? Clear. Vaccination? Fully vaccinated. COVID test? Yes, valid test results are in. Arrive can? Received. Great, we're ready. Santa, you're good to go. Welcome back. Santa is now cleared for Canadian airspace. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas, everyone. Please stay safe. Santa, he even has that Arrive Can app. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. we have to bring in our resident pilot. And no, we're not mm -hmm. talking about Johanna. Nick, you're also a pilot. Yes. This is very good news. It is good news. Yeah, the other good part about this is that uh, of course he's got Rudolph because we're going to have some nasty weather to contend with but Rudolph can get through anything so not to worry for the kids out there if you're looking out going oh it's going to be snowing that's okay it's okay Santa will find his way to you um, temperatures are going to drop off though so he's going to have to bundle up right now we're sitting above the zero mark here's a look at some of the temperatures uh, Metro Vancouver seeing temperatures around the three four degree mark there as you head up the Fraser Valley though we're looking at temperatures that are closer to the zero mark and uh, that's going to affect the kind of precipitation that we see now we've got special weather statements in effect in the areas in blue here and also snowfall warning as well for the system that's uh, approaching now, it's going to bring with it some cold weather that's one aspect of this some mixed precipitation uh, through tonight and tomorrow and then snowfall as we head into the weekend and I think we're probably going to see some more warnings popping up over the next 24 hours as the system pushes in we're also getting this push of cold air moving through now here's a look at the forecast heading through tonight so tonight it's a little bit of a mixed bag areas closer to the water around Metro Vancouver uh, expecting to see kind of mixed precipitation rain snow rain snow back and forth uh, as you move further in Inland, though, we're expecting to see more of a snowfall event here, and certainly as we head through Friday afternoon and into Friday eve uh, overnight, rather, it's a snowfall event that continues right through Saturday and Sunday. Now, how much can we expect? The amounts are going to vary. It really kind of depends on where you are. If you're closer to the water, you're looking at uh, by tomorrow about two centimeters, but into Saturday. Um, I've got Vancouver showing uh, in the neighborhood of about 10 centimeters. Now, if we get a little bit of colder push, could be higher, but generally 10 centimeters. And then as you move further inland, you're looking at higher accumulations. There's a look at the forecast across the province. And when we uh, zoom in here for Vancouver, we're looking at temperatures that are continuing to drop. Uh, again, 2 to 10 centimeters of snow, too closer to the water. 10 as you get a little bit further inland. But look at these overnight lows. That's going to help to accumulate the snow. And I think... Definitely when you wake up on Christmas Day, you're looking at not only snow on the ground, but snow falling at the same time. And oh. I believe that is the definition of a perfect, perfect Christmas. I can I already remember. picture it uh, in the pajamas, a blanket, the fire going and the snow coming down. That's right. Sounds wonderful. Thanks, Nick. You bet. Well, your home might be decorated for Christmas, but what about your car? Maybe a Santa hat on the dash? Well, in Toronto, one Uber driver is going all in. Our CBC crews spoke with her about festive van Toronto and the reaction from riders. Sometimes it takes them a second glance, like, and they see the lights, they're like, are you an Uber or is this for an event? I'm like, no, this is your Uber. Hello, I'm Forrest Atkinson, and I'm the driver of festive van Toronto. So I did decorate for Christmas last year, but this year I stepped it up. I have my four foot Christmas tree there, but I also have a Santa Claus and a snowman, extra things underneath the tree. My stuffed animals here that give out candy to all my passengers. I just basically took it to the next level with all of my decorations. 
Honestly, when things were very locked down, it meant so much to me to put decorations here, have somebody come in and just really brighten their day. There is not a person that has like stepped in here that hasn't taken a photo before they left. And that really makes my day. Oh no. My boyfriend is a wheelchair user himself. He has a spinal cord injury, and I um, happened to know through him that you could lease these from Uber. It was originally because I just wanted to have an accessible vehicle for us, but then uh, when I put it on the app, I realized how much it was helping the community of Toronto be accessible and how much it was needed. At this point, like I know uh, people through my Instagram who can just message me anytime they want to have a ride if they can't find a vehicle close to them that is wheelchair accessible. I know so much about the world now being an uber driver with my passengers i just know it brings a lot of joy i know because of covid we're not always doing the things that we want to so to kind of get into this car and take your mind off of things take photos take a video have something to post it's very very cheerful i never thought that being an uber driver could be like this you can love your job this much and it can kind of bring things back to you merry christmas I won't say no to getting picked up in that Uber, that's for sure. Okay, they are soft, squishy, and huggable. They are called Squishmallows, and the plush toy isn't just loved by adults and children. As Robin Miller found out, the collectible has become hard to find as its popularity has grown during the pandemic. <laughs> excited. I'm trying to find the axolotl one, which still hasn't popped up yet. Emma Mitchell but has a following on TikTok of more than 21,000, and all she talks about are these, squishmallows, or squish, a plush toy that's been soaring in popularity throughout the pandemic. They're so bright and fun, and especially like in the last two years, it's been such a dark, awful time. So it was kind of this just positive thing to look to in a time that's felt so dark. Mitchell has collected at least 450 Squishmallows. If you're from Quebec and you collect Squishmallows. Through videos on social media, she's met collectors from around the world. People like her looking to add to their Squish Squad. Sometimes I go to a store and I find nothing and that's still, people are watching that too. The Squishmallow craze is one the owner of this independent toy store knows well. He compares them to the Beanie Babies boom of the late 1990s. Now they're insane, but there's no product out there. So um, if you're able to buy them, you should buy them. Emily McGee is trying to help parents out, selling a portion of her collection exclusively to those with young children and donating her earnings to charity. I want to sell those to them so then they can give their kids a good Christmas. McGee knows parents are competing against a portion of the Squishmallow community that buys in bulk and resells the toys at a higher price point. Despite her expansive collection, Mitchell says for her, it's not about the money. Every once in a while you might think to yourself, like, oh man, I could really make some money on this, but like at what cost? You know, I find the community aspect a lot more fun. Robin Miller, CBC News, Ottawa. A Christmas carol in Cree from an artist inspired to learn her language and honor her community through music and education. My name's Bruce Noble, and I'm very proud to be one of Santa's helpers. So nobody wakes up and says, oh, I want to be Santa Claus today. What happens is, as with me, you get a phone call saying, um, the janitor that was going to do the Christmas pageant broke his leg. Can you be Santa? And you say, okay, I can do it. And you get hooked because when you get there, 
when the joy, the chaos that erupts when you walk into a school auditorium and you've got 400 kids suddenly screaming out your name as Santa, <laughs> there's nothing like it. But I retired recently and uh, I wasn't quite sure what to do. And fortunately, I've got a very wise uh, wife who said, why don't you go to Santa school? Um, and I did. There were 240 people at the Santa school that I went to in October this year. It's the C.W. Howard School for Santa. C.W. Howard was the uh, Santa at Macy's who provided technical advice when they filmed The Miracle on 34th Street. Oh, Christmas isn't just a day. It's a frame of mind. And his motto was, they err who think Santa comes down in through the chimney. He comes in through the heart. After the introductions, they talk a little bit about the history of Santa, and that's fine, but everybody knew it. More particularly, they started talking about questions, about how to deal with things. After that, they started talking about the problems of being a Santa in a pandemic world. And that's where information became very, very useful. It's hard to be personally, socially in contact with a child when you're socially distant. Santa sanitizes very carefully. And actually, Santa has a mask that he wears over his beard. So it's kind of helpful. And a very Merry Christmas to you. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. The Push International Performing Arts Festival returns. Enjoy theater, dance, music, and multimedia by local, national, and international artists. Visit pushfestival.ca for tickets and more information. And stream holiday episodes of your favorite CBC shows like Schitt's Creek and The Great Canadian Baking Show with the free CBC Gem app. Check it out at gem.cbc.ca. As 2021 draws to a close, many Indigenous communities are looking back at a difficult year. Discoveries at former residential schools have opened painful wounds. The CBC's Bonnie Allen brings us the story of a Cree Métis woman in Saskatchewan who has found peace through song and language. Christmas carol in her traditional language of Cree, performed with the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. At center stage, Fallon Baptiste is confident and proud, but she didn't always feel this way. Baptiste grew up on Red Pheasant First Nation in Saskatchewan. By junior high, she had to bus off reserve to attend school in a nearby city. It was so clear as a 12-year-old girl that all right, what, whomever you are is not okay. So we need to change who you are to fit in. I spent a large part of my life trying to prove to others that I wasn't First Nation, that I wasn't Indian. The exception was when she sang in Cree, especially Christmas carols. Eventually, she realized she needed to embrace the traditional language and culture in the rest of her life. So Baptiste learned to read, write, and speak Cree fluently and started teaching Cree at a Saskatoon high school. Sometimes my dad is like surprised because like he knows he didn't teach me that. I get to learn for the children that never got to learn their language. There's almost a process of self-acceptance that has to take place. 
and they're proud of who they are. They, they stand a little taller, they walk a little prouder down the hallway. At home, Baptiste translates songs into Cree and records them. Earlier this year, she was going to release an album of religious songs, but stopped after the discovery of unidentified remains at former church-run residential schools. And so I stopped the project altogether, and I thought, no, this isn't the time for it. She doesn't feel the same about Cree carols. She says Christmas is a time to celebrate the Creator, community, and culture, and for her to stand tall. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. A beautiful story, so important to preserve our Indigenous languages and an amazing voice at that. That is our show for tonight. Thanks so much for being with us. Dan is here tomorrow, and I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful and safe holiday.